with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we'll begin with the reading or the approval of our minutes from last month, if everyone's had a chance to look over them. I make a motion that we approve the operating statements from June 17th, the closed session meetings from June 17th, the meeting minutes from July 8th, the work set, I'm sorry, the June 2017 council meeting minutes, the July 8, 2019 work session minutes and Quantum's financial statement for June 2019. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Or we have any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, ayes? Aye. Aye. No, motion's carried. Okay, uh, next on our agenda, we have Vicki Prettyman. I think I got that correct. Uh, we'll have you come up to the- And Mayor, if I could just uh, remind the council that uh, on March 29th, uh, a few of us attended a meeting at Maryland Department of the Environment. And uh, as a result of that, MDE had uh, reached out to CERCAP, um, which is a, an agency that assists small rural communities with public works and growth issues uh, at no charge. Uh, and we talked about this and, and I, we had uh, contacted MDE and sort of verified that, that they were, uh, would, were recommending CERCAP as a, a good source for the town. Uh, we talked about that in May. Council uh, wanted to, was ready to at least hear what CERCAP might have to offer. And uh, so Vicki, um, along with uh, Gene Holloway, who I understand Gene will make the presentation to you tonight, uh, we'll explain a little bit about what CERCAP might have to offer. We have, uh, in the interim, sent them a, a wave of information to just give them an idea of some of our issues with water, sewer, uh, the, the growth facing the town, so they have some background. Uh, and, and also, it, I guess what started this was the discussion about rate studies, uh, which we're not quite ready to enter into yet, but um, CERCAP also uh, is, gets involved in the rate study, so that might be something that we can think about as Gene talks to us. So with that, uh, Gene Holloway. Good evening. I'm coming to this a little bit late. Um, Vicki did a lot of the research from the information that was sent, but um, I'm the state manager for CERCAP. We are a regional nonprofit that serves seven states from Delaware down to Florida. We are part of the Rural Community Assistance Partnership. There are six such region, regions, nation, I can't talk, nationwide and in Puerto Rico. Um, and we all receive different program funding um, through our national parent organization to provide free services to towns like Union Bridge, small towns, anything under 10,000 in population. And we help you basically solve problems. A lot of the small towns we work with may only have two or 300 people. We may have one or two staff people, so we kind of try and fill in the gaps. Um, our main reason for being is to help bring uh, small towns, rural communities, um, into um, more modern practices and trying to help uh, build capacity, I think is the best way to put it. Build both your technical, managerial, and financial capacity. I did put a presentation that looks like this in your packet. Um, that is uh, kind of a standard training session I do for mayors and councils to talk about my approach to doing rate studies. Right now, I'm the one that does most of the rates. Well, I'm the one that does all of them right now. Um, but I will be uh, handing that over probably soon to, to Vicki or one. Well, there's only three of us in the Delaware, Maryland office. So the choices are me or two others. So that's as good as it gets. Uh, but as far as our region, we have, we have 48 staff people. We even have individual housing programs that are operated out of our office in Roanoke, Virginia, uh, which is where our corporate office is. Um, I did bring along, I just brought one copy because they don't give me but so many of our annual report. This gives you some ideas of some of the things we've done. There's a, um, a, a case study in here from Delaware, another from Maryland because we work in both states. Uh, we also have some things like guides like this, which I can get for you individually, or I just brought one copy tonight, formulating great rates for small systems. Um, and also, 
protecting water quality, and then the big guy for small systems for board members. So these are some of the resources that we can provide. But our services include helping you with applications for funding. If you were to have a major project and upgrade, um, we can help you find funding. We can help you fill out the application. I'm going to let Vicki talk about that. She's uh, working under a new program that we just got this year funded through USDA Rural Development to help uh, communities with rural RD apply, which is their application process. That's all computerized now, and it's given some of the smaller towns a lot of headaches trying to get through it. So we have this new project uh, where she will help you find funding. I myself have been a grants administrator. We've both been town administrators. So we've kind of sat on your side of the desk, on Dawn's side of the desk, and listened to people tell us what we ought to be doing and how we ought to do it. But um, we try to keep that in mind and not make decisions for you or force you into decisions. We try to help you figure out what your alternatives are and what the best decisions are. And when you're ready for a rate study, um, I can provide that. I have about, I think I have six in the pipeline at present. Um, but, you know, I, uh, we can work it in. Um, as I say, we're, we're all over the place. We even do solid waste, um, helping people set up recycling programs, and we do education programs and things like that. I do a lot of training. I can do a specialized training for Union Bridge or can use your council chambers to train people from the area, whatever uh, works out for you. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I don't have a standard spiel when it comes to explaining our organization. Uh, in spite of, we just got back from training teaching us how to sell our, uh, how sell our services, and I guess I didn't learn very much, but um, I never did believe in hard sells anyway. So does anybody have any questions or anything that I didn't cover that you're curious about? Well, I is it still that your grants, that doesn't cover new development, it just covers the existing? Depends on the program. Okay. Depends on the program. There are funding programs, for example, USDA will fund what they call reasonable growth um, in the course of an upgrade. For example, if you have to upgrade your water system. Now, if the project is all about growth, then they might back down from that. Um, the SRF program in Maryland, I'm not sure, Vicki probably knows more about the restrictions on that than I do at this point. Um, I've been operating in Delaware for so long, I've forgotten what I did learn about Maryland, and most of it's changed. Um, but there are more restrictions on growth projects right. than there are on upgrades with growth included. Well, I think that's one thing that we're, you know, we have two developments that are on the books for Union Bridge, but both of them have, you know, we have growth problems with our sewer plant right. and you know people said well why don't you help get these developments going but from what we've understood so far it does not the, the grants do not cover new development it will cover what we have to do as far as upgrading our present system for right. the existing union bridge but not for new growth that's right. what I think she may have some answers that we might now again we USDA have to work will with. fund what they consider right. reasonable growth and what's you know, reasonable is a subjective term, so it just depends if, you Who know, reads if it? <laughs> 75 percent of your project is for new growth and 25 percent is for upgrade, that they're probably not going to fund. Right. It. If the balance is the other way, they probably would. So it just depends. Uh, but we will help you try and find funding. <coughs> and very often, it's a jigsaw puzzle. It's not any one source anyway. So sometimes we can find what one source won't fund. Maybe we can find another one that will. We also have our own internal run out of the Roanoke office, our own internal loan program up to $250,000. So I know that's not a lot of money when you think about public works, but very often that provides a bridge if you're getting USDA funding and it's not going to come through for another year, then you know that can help you get through the, the out-of-pocket costs. So that's a possibility as well. Okay. Um, but I would encourage you to look at our, our, our annual report and see some of our case studies and some of the things that we can do. Um, the main thing is we are here to help you. Um, we're not from the government, and we are here to help you, and we don't charge anything. That's the good uh, part. We also, I also have some training <coughs> that I do on capital improvement projects and planning and how to calculate impact fees and things like that. So if you're looking at a high, high amount of growth impact fees, or capital recovery charges, as they are more palatable to call them, um, we may be able to help you calculate 
calculate those as well. Okay. So, any other questions for me? Yes, I, I have a question. If the town seeks to use your services, does, is there some kind of retainer agreement or we just call you when we need you? Just say, I want you to do whatever for us and we set up a project on our internal data capture service. Once it's in DCS, um, our data capture system, excuse me, once it's in DCS, it's in concrete for us. And that's all we really need. We also, one thing I did neglect to mention, um, we have a uh, nationally recognized uh, form for d doing technical, managerial, and financial capacity assessments. And it will, we, we ask, sit down with, with Dawn, sit down with your water operator, your wastewater operator, as the case may be, and ask a bunch of questions. And depending on the answers to those questions, it will pop up areas of critical concern or just areas of concern or deficiencies. So sometimes that's the place that we start. It's not a retainer as such, but it gives you a starting point and helps you figure out what you need to work on first. Because a lot of times in a small community, everything is top priority and you have to figure out what comes first. And sometimes that kind of assessment will help you figure that out. So that's something that we would do, we could do at, at your request. And again, no charge. Okay. In this case, you get more than what you pay for, I hope. Okay, good. Well, uh, there's also <clears throat> not so hypothetical situation that we have now, preliminary to the rate study stage. We have these two developers and their engineers uh, interacting with the town's engineering firm to come up with the, uh, I guess this, well, to come up with a, a scope of study to determine the way to expand the plant or expand capacity, whether it's this plant, another plant, or a combination of plants. And, you know, we're hearing uh, costs in the range of sixty to $100,000 just to do the study. Now, is, is that something that you might be able to find some uh, grant money for or some assistance? Well, I'm going to let Vicki address that because she knows more about that part of it than I do. I know that USDA has search grants, but right now Maryland is maxed out. There is no more Maryland money. But I'm going to let her step up. For okay. Right. And I'll just rip my own earring off. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh. Hi. Thank you again for having us. Um, Vicki Prettyman with CERCAP. Um, so currently, the search grant funding that USDA has in place is expensed for 2019, and they're already saying that 2020 is expensed as well. Um, there's a small amount uh, that USDA gives each state, and right now it's at 70. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, it's right now it's at $70,000 a state. So um, Maryland is. There's a lot of rural towns that are needing this search grant money. And again, it pays, that's a 100% grant, um, anywhere from twenty-five dollars to $30,000 that it would give a, a small rural community. But there is a PPG, a planning, a preliminary planning grant that is available to communities. And at 75%, and the community would then pay a 25%. So at least 75% of that estimated $60,000 could be paid by USDA um, on a PPG. And we would be able to process that application fairly quickly um, to request those funds. Um, on, there's everything now with USDA is online. It's all our, through RD Apply. Um, we would do an e-authenticate process uh, with the town for the financial side of things. And then um, you would then give me authorization um, as an authorized user and the engineer um, for the town would also have authorization so they could upload any type of preliminary data. Um, so that is planning grants. Now we do a planning grant for the water system and also a planning grant for the wastewater system. So they would be two separate um, grants that would be available to the municipality. There is one other option. There's no guarantees. We have an affiliation with the Community Engineering Board, which is a domestic version of Engineers Without Borders, and we have successfully applied to them before, and they would do the study for no cost at all. But that's something that's, uh, you know, we would have to get that approved. Um, I'm just finishing up a project in Southern Maryland that they have done a study for a small community there. So I'd have to get some details, and I would write the application, and then we 
roll the dice and see if it would get funded. But that's a possibility that could be done for nothing if they would accept it. They also work on a volunteer basis, so that would be yes. after yeah. after work is when they would come in. Mm -hmm. uh, so it does take uh, more time. It would take over a year for them to even do the study. So also, that's the only thing. Yeah. growth should pay for oh go ahead. Growth should pay for growth. Right. So we want to really look at what your um, impact fees are and how those impact fees coming from those new developers would then pay for the growth portion of your upgrades to your water and wastewater. But the preliminary planning, the PER, the preliminary engineering report is very important. Um, and funding for those, again, search grant is, el they're eligible, you guys are eligible for a search grant, but when the, ex the expense, the, it's all expensed, when we can put an application in um, for a search grant and hope for 2020, um, a, you know, an award in 2020, but uh, PPG is something that we could get an answer back much more quickly. Federal fiscal year will start October 1st, yes. so the new cycle will begin then. Mm -hmm. It just depends on the timing. Um, okay. That. You mentioned a program where there is a town match, so a grant with a town match. I mean, this may not be a fair question mm -hmm. generically, but um, could the developers be made to pay that? In other words, if the town could get a, a, a grant of X number of dollars and, they, and the town contribution would be some other lesser number, could, could that be? I would um, have to ask that, um, but it all depends on how your um, public works agreement with those developers is written. If that were an exaction from the town that you required of the developer, I don't think they yeah. care. I don't think MDE would care where you got the money from. It would be an expense, yeah, that all the USDA wants to know is if the town, if that will be coming from town funds. Now, if there's an agreement between the new de the developer and the town in that public works agreement or in those agreements um, that all engineering fees will be paid by um, by the developer, then I, I would say yes, because uh, well, that would be an expense. That's in our annexation yes. agreements. Yes. We yeah. don't have public works agreements yet because we're not okay. quite far enough along, okay. but when we annexed uh, these two large properties, uh -huh. we have, I mean, it was hard to predict the, what the exact costs were going to be, but we have right. generic language that So you do have them. an annexation agreement with yes. these new developers already? Yes. Okay. That would be helpful to see too, John. That would be. Surely they'd be happier paying 25% of the cost than they would. Uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So in a, um, again, as Jean had stated, we're both town administrators um, in the in our past life. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, um, I, and I've been with SIRCAP for the last, for six months now. I just celebrated my six month anniversary. Um, but there was a situation where um, uh, my previous employer, we needed a backup well. The USDA funded it, and in a public works agreement uh, we had with, that developer, they paid, you know, the balance of it. So it's it's more often called public works agreements in Delaware than it yes. is annexation agreements. Yes. But it's kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot there's options. We gotta get into the meat of these new developments and really look at annexation agreement and what their plans really are. And again, impact fees are um, you can, you know, that's in the public works agreement, that's where you kind of get into where are you going to do this for the town or are we going to charge you a per EDU impact fee um, water and then a per EDU wastewater impact fee. And we can be in that, you know, in that communication with you and give you as much advice and experience um, as we can um, as you guys are going through this. I used to work for the Environmental Finance Center at the University of Maryland and we did a study some time ago and I still use their formulas, but it was on how to calculate impact fees, and it depends on capacity available and how much capacity you have to add, and there's different formulas, but that's something that I can help you with if it comes to, if you don't already have a calculation. Well, we have uh, the skeleton of the public works agreements pretty well negotiated uh -huh. with a bunch of blanks, and these are the numbers that you're talking about, mm -hmm. and we just don't know uh, we're not even close at this point until we know what needs to be built, what capacity we need, what it's going to cost. Um, 
and we we can't get to that until we have a scope of what has to be done so that's wh that's where we are we are here to work with the town engineers and town council and in any way you guys see fit that you want to bring us in again we work for you i think that's really important to know that we're not gonna like gina said before we're not gonna tell we're we're gonna give you advice <laughs> um just from experience um with working with multiple municipalities and the capacities that we've been in um and some out of the box ideas that um you know and some and, and again with the engineers too yeah. but our job is again is to help you identify alternatives and and give you whatever you need to make the decision the decision is still yours absolutely sounds good Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank and you. I went to college in Westminster, so I love coming up here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll go on down to the mayor's report, and means we have a gentleman here now, Connor Daly. Let's see. Laura, you want to, would you want to do this? Means you were there. Oh. One that did it all at the school. Oh. Oh. Well, you can introduce him. And you yeah. have him read his essay if he'd okay. like to. I think it's written. You know what? Come up, Connor. Connor. Just so you know what it is. I think it's on there. Yeah. So this is Connor Daly. Um, Better use the microphone. Use the microphone. Yes. Don't want to be mad at you. This is Connor Daly of Union Bridge. Um, the fourth graders every year are asked to participate in the If I Were Mayor essay writing contest. Um, I go to Elmer Wolf and I talk to all the fourth graders. I invite them to write an essay and we submit the essays to the Maryland Municipal League um, for the If I Were Mayor contest. And we always pick one from the local elementary school um, of an essay that we like. And so we chose Connor this year as uh, the best essay for Elmer Wolf Elementary School. So we want Connor to read his essay. I have it here before we do. Um, I want to give Connor, we have a certificate of recognition. And it says, to Connor Daly in recognition of your outstanding essay for the 2019 If I Were Mayor Essay Contest. So congratulations, Connor. <laughs> a gift certificate for you to go to Original Pizza with your family to support our local businesses. And if you want to come up here, you can read your essay in the microphone. <laughs> I think she wants you to turn the mic around yeah, so you can see him behind. There you go. Talk. Go ahead. Sorry, I need to help him. Oh, yeah. Well, you. Yeah, that's okay. essay I'm not going to read it but he wrote about community policing and how we should be more of a community and help each other and look out for one another um, to call the police when necessary and to help around the neighborhood like helping with moving day driving people somewhere if they don't have a driver's license or if their parents aren't home um, and helping them if they have money lying around that they don't need they can donate it to other people so he did a good job and it was a unique essay and he was the only one who wrote about that topic I think because his dad's a police officer. <laughs> but it was a great essay, Connor, so thank you for coming tonight. And Ellen, do you remember how many we had from Elton Wolf this year? We had a bunch. Uh, it was 41, I believe. I think it was 41 essays, 41 essays from Elmer Wolf this year, so that was pretty good. Every year there gets to be a couple of more, so <laughs> thank you for your time, and I thank Laura because like I say, it's a lot of the towns the mayors go, but over the years, it's very difficult to get into Elmer Wolf School at a particular time, and being as Laura is out there, she volunteers a lot and everything, so she has taken on that project to go and uh, 
work with the school on those projects. So I appreciate that very much for taking care of that for me. And that was actually one of 2,711 essays that were judged for the contest oh. statewide. So, that's good, thank you. Okay, we'll go right on down with some other things on my report. Uh, this past month, uh, uh, July the 10th was our town manager's luncheon, which we don't have a town manager, but I do attend that luncheon every month. Uh, um, the WRCC, which is the Water Resource Co Coalition uh, Coordination Council for Carroll County, we meet every month. Uh, in the last 10 years, the county has gotten, received $17 million in grants, and that was basically uh, the grants people there that was working, this was to upgrade and um, restore some of the stormwater management ponds in Carroll County. So they've done a good job at that. And uh, probably within the next month, they're going to be starting at the uh, stormwater management pond at Elmer Wolf School. They're going to redo that one uh, to do some upgrades. And then they're also looking to do another project in Union Bridge to take care of some of the stormwater that runoff that we have from Main Street down. Uh, they're still looking on a possible way to get that done in Union Bridge. Um, Last uh, Thursday, the 18th, I attended a celebration in Tonytown. They had the city of Tonytown had a celebration for Jim McCarran that was 20, 20 some years in service as a councilman, uh, Maryland Municipal League president, uh, president in the past, uh, was mayor for I don't know how many years. So they had a very nice celebration for him. And I presented a uh, proclamation from the Maryland Municipal League uh, because it was closer to Union Bridge and up here at this end of the county, so I gave that proclamation. And it was uh, a night that the Carroll County mayors gave him a very nice proclamation. Uh, all of them signed it. Uh, and all eight mayors were there this time. Was all eight mayors attended, so that was very good uh, attendance over there. Uh, Saturday, Donald and I attended the... Uh, down at the Flood Plain Brewery, or Lucy's, where you want to call it, Lucy's Lower Red Wagon event, down at North End of Town. It was a sweet corn eating contest. Um, and Donald and I was there to represent, we were there as council people and mayor, but we were also the uh, two of the judges for the sweet corn eating contest. That was very interesting. They had, uh, I don't know, about 12, 13 kids from five to 10, and a couple from 12, from 11 to 17 and from 18 and above, and they had to see how much sweet corn, the grown-ups had to husk their corn and see how much they could eat in five minutes. Uh, we had uh, three judges there, we had to judge those people, and then the little kids, that was really great to see them. They had sweet corn from all over their face up to their ears, their eyes, and that was, that was very nice. Uh, more of those kind of things we need in town. Last month, also, uh, Limbo's uh, Railroad Pub down here had a, uh, uh, what do you call it, per suicide, suicide prevention, prevention uh, event down there for a young man in town here that uh, uh, had suicide back in March or something like that. So they had this suicide prevention event, and that was very well attended that day. They made, uh, I think someone said, around $4,000 to give to suicide prevention. So uh, these are the kind of things we like to hear. It's the positive things that's going on in Union Bridge um, instead of some of the negative stuff that we hear all the time. So you're going to see more and more different kinds of activities going on around town, people working together, doing these kind of events. Uh, so. Uh, all we do is make sure that you come out and they're attended because it's a lot of effort that goes in these events. And it was uh, just to go show you the other day, it was 100 degrees down there and there was probably in and out during the day of probably a couple hundred people. So the weather doesn't always keep everybody away. Uh, we did a lot of sweating that day, didn't we, Donald? But it was, it was very hot. nice. It was hot. Um, so we do have, right here, we have the people that, the guy that uh, him and his wife have a snowball stand down here couple nights a week and right on Ebert Road we'd have soft ice cream so there's a lot of things that make people come around Union Bridge right now you snowballs or soft ice cream and um, there's going to be all kinds of events that's going to happen later this fall and throughout the year so we're kind of excited about that um, then all the, the mayor and council attended the uh, conference in Ocean City um, last month it was June the 23rd to the uh, 25th 
It was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And I think everybody has a list of whatever they did all day long, every day. We, uh, everybody has a report of what they did. It was meetings all day long. Uh, we had uh, general sessions on Monday and Tuesday. We had meetings on uh, active shooters, community response teams. Uh, I attended a couple of board of directors meetings. Um, so everybody has a list of everything, and we're not gonna sit here and bore you with every meeting that we attended in those three days, but it's not Ocean, well, they changed it from Ocean City Convention to Ocean City Conference because it is a work. It's not just going down there and sitting around. Uh, it's, it's all day there. Half, uh, most of the mornings I was there between 8, 8.30 in the morning. Ellen, she's there a lot of times in the morning helping with registration. So, and then when you attend these meetings all day long and everything, there's, they're well worth the money to go down there and find out how the other municipalities work, uh, the different se uh, seminars that they have. It's a very, very good networking affair. And I think that this year was the record uh, number of people that attended and then also with the concessions they had a record number of concessions they had people they had to turn away they could not get in there with their wares they wanted to so people to come to your your stands and see so next year they're going to move all the big equipment outside so they'd have more room inside for more concession stands so that's the plans right now so better and better and better every year uh that's about all that i have on mine right now other than I did bring this, this painting in, we've had this painting in the town office for a couple of years now. Uh, Richard Eichmann was a, a, a famous painter, the portrait a painter that lived here in town. He did a lot of portraits of different children around town. This is one of the ones that was into the bank for a long time. The bank closed up. We inherited it. We really don't have room to hang this hand here. I know it's a beautiful painting. It's someone's child. And I know if they knew it was here, they would love to have it in their home or because Richard Eichmann's a very famous person. Uh, between the painting and the framework on it, um, I would like the, the owner, the original owner, to get it back. A lot of his paintings went to the historical society and um, I would really much rather see this go back to the family than the historical society. I as, think it was, as long ago as that was painted, that child is probably a grown adult. That, that child is grown up. We have one out here is one of uh, Jack Cromer's sons on the wall here, and his son is grown up and has kids the size of that. So, so the, the adult. But this one here is the, this was probably a twenty-five to thirty-year-old painting. So uh, hopefully somebody will see it, come down and claim it. I would like to give it back to your rightful owner and. Uh, so that they can have something, uh, like I say, one day it's Richard Eichmann's paintings are going to be worth some money. So that's the all I have right now. Um, we'll go to John. Okay. Well, I do have uh, in my update sort of an update of what's happening in our Public Service Commission case. Um, we uh, the town has gotten formal notice of the the second public hearing, which will be on August 19th. This is the same date that we've announced starting at 6.30, this time at the fire hall, uh, rather than the community center. I'm not sure we mentioned that. The la I'm not sure we knew that the last time. Uh, so uh, no changes there. I think that um, uh, what council can be doing in the meantime is, you know, encouraging uh, townspeople, county uh, officials, delegates, you know, to, to be supportive of the town as part of that process. If they can come, that's great. If they can send a letter, that's great. But uh, anything that can uh, throw some support behind the, the town's position. Uh, preliminary to that, we have, the lawyers have a status conference with the judge on August 6th. Um, now that most of the um, paperwork has been filed, uh, I guess the, the judge kind of wants to hear uh, where we think, uh, you know, the case is going from, from here on. So uh, that will happen on August. So nothing for the council to do on that, but I'll report back uh, hopefully by the time you have your work session in August if there's anything to know. Um, there were filings by the um, P 
PPRP and the Public Service Commission by the July 12th deadline. Of course, we, we did our filing a little bit early, uh, and you all should have copies of that. So that was Ned Cuman's testimony and the opposition document. Um, the uh, other testimony and information came in while I was on vacation, so I'm a little bit late getting it to you. Uh, today's my first day back, but I've read through it all, and I've gotten it to Dawn now. Uh, she didn't have it earlier today. So she, okay, so it, maybe it has been sent, but yes. I'm sure you haven't had a chance to look at it. But, but I thought I'd take this opportunity to sort of explain to you what you're looking at. Uh, the, the PPRP um, is the sort of the clearinghouse agency for the state. They go to various state agencies, they get input, uh, they study the project from a technical standpoint, from planning, zoning, all the different angles, and then they do an assessment. And that assessment is part of what you, what you have now. So they call it a draft assessment, but it's, I think, pretty close to, to final. Um, there's also a secretarial letter which kind of sums up uh, the position of seven or eight state agencies and the, the secretaries of each agency you'll see sign it so it's it's been it's been sort of vetted through the, each process and, um, and and you'll see you'll see that uh, and the secretarial letter is only a couple of pages so if you're looking for a quick um, view of where the, the state's coming from, you'll see, you'll see that. And, and what you'll see is that um, the agencies feel like from a technical standpoint that, that they're supportive of the project uh, and they think it could be made to work. Um, they do not believe that the landscape screening is adequate that's been proposed on the plan. So they want more screening and they go into great detail as to what they want screened and where they want it screened. It has to do with historical properties. It has to do with glare. It has to do with the entrance to town. Uh, so that's all good stuff. And they recognize the town as an interested party in that. So at, at one point, they even uh, make, make the point that the town will need to approve uh, you know, that landscaping to the extent it will protect town residents and property. The, um, the assessment itself is a really voluminous document. Um, it has a lot of technical electrical distribution type discussion that as a town we can't take a position on because we don't have independent expertise on that. Uh, so we have to rely on the state. And so I didn't spend a lot of time focusing on that. Uh, one disappointing part of the assessment itself, the big thick document, uh, was that it, it didn't really discuss our position that this project is inconsistent with the, with the town's comprehensive plan, which is, which is to me, an ironclad position. Um, however, in the secretarial letter, and I'll read this little excerpt, but I know you'll, you'll want to go back and look at it in greater detail, but they very much acknowledge Ned's position um, on the master plan, and there's a lot of language in here encouraging citizens to come back to the town and talk about, you know, how they can satisfy, you know, the town's position on this. Uh, in the secretarial letter, which again is signed by seven different agency uh, secretaries of seven different agencies, one of which is is Secretary McCord of the Department of Planning, and um, it says, finally, we encourage citizens UB Solar to continue discussions with the town of Union Bridge regarding the annexation of project lands into the town as contemplated by the comprehensive plan. So it's kind of interesting. They put it in the letter, which is a kind of the most important statement to me, but it's not really fleshed out that well in, in the Kelly testimony. And, and that's the other thing. Uh, Fred Kelly is, uh, is sort of the uh, engineer expert that presents testimony on behalf of PPRP. So you'll see his testimony. Um, if you really dig into it, his testimony pretty much tracks along with the assessment. So they're two big, thick documents, but they, there's a lot of repetition between the two. Um, but Kelly is basically backing up what, uh, 
what the assessment will tell you. Um, Kelly will discuss and acknowledge Ned's position on the comprehensive plan, but that's about as far as he goes. He acknowledges the town's position, but he doesn't actually agree with it. But in the secretarial letter, that's a pretty strong statement. So um, that, that part was encouraging. Uh, the other highlights, if there's anything else I haven't mentioned. And there is, in a couple of different places, you'll see where uh, the agencies just generally say that uh, the, the town will need to approve permits and do site plan review because part of this project's in the town anyway. So they've, they've recognized that. So that gives the town a little bit of leverage even, you know, no matter how this turns out. And the last thing I'll mention is that we sent, um, I talked to a representative from Maryland Municipal League and uh, they, as you all may know, they played a part, I think, with MAKO right. in, in affecting the legislation that we're now dealing with that requires the judge to give, quote, due consideration to the master plan and the zoning, which is, you know, our strongest point. Uh, that this is inconsistent with the master plan. So MML has an interest in this. I think it was Ellen that sent around a, a newspaper article oh, about yeah. uh, a recent week, court yeah. decision. Mm -hmm. You know, that decision, we looked at that issue at the beginning and felt like it's not going to be worth appealing that because it, and, and the decision was seven to nothing that this idea of preemption that we talked about at the beginning, the state law does preempt uh, our local zoning, except for this language that was negotiated in by MAKO and MML that requires the Public Service Commission to give due consideration to the plan. Doesn't say how much weight, but you know our position is that's pretty important, especially when this is diametrically opposed to our plan. Um, so uh, just to follow up, we, we sent uh, our position information, Ned's testimony to MML, uh, it's been over a week now, and I haven't heard back from them, but they know the issue, and they're interested in the issue because this may be the first time that a solar developer has tried to fit the project right into the, into the town, you know, right into the, the municipal planning area, and, and you know, we think they should be interested, and we've talked to them because, you know, could this happen anywhere else? It's not just Union Bridge. And do we want the developers, when they're seeking out land, to seek out land that's right on top of main streets all over the state, or do we want the message to be that, you know, that's protected land? You ought to be real careful when you get too close, you know, to the residential core of, of the main street community. So uh, hopefully we'll get some support from ML, MML on that, and uh, you know we'll stay tuned. So um, that's, in a nutshell, kind of where we are right now. And uh, you all may have questions. I, I'm thinking that uh, even though I don't ordinarily attend the work sessions, because of the timing, uh, that might be a good idea on April 12th, which will be a week before the public hearing and after the time that we've had the status conference uh, with, with the judge. Okay. But we can cross that bridge when we come to it. Okay. You mean August? August. August 12th. What did I say? April. Oh, April. <laughs> yeah, I meant August. That begins with an A. I had a curiosity question <laughs> about the, the, the judge's, um, what did they call that? The judge's letter where he, asked if we wanted to sit with him at the public meeting. Right. And yeah, I, I think, that, well. I was just curious as to, to, you know, what that involved, just sitting there beside him? Yeah. And you just... Yeah, and, and, and sort of presiding, just like you all sit up here rather than sitting down in the audience. Um, so I don't see that as a, requiring a lot more effort. I mean, we know the case, you know, we're prepared. No, no, I just was curious as to, you know, I'd never been to any of these kind of things before where the, a public hearing where you had a, the judge there and the law judge, rather, and 
I just wasn't sure what that meant. If I sat up there with, with the judge and, or any of us did, you know. I think that they want to give the town the opportunity to be part of the decision body. And, in a, and remember, in a lot of cases, the town is going to, or the county might be supportive of what's happening. And so it makes a lot more sense that they would be up there answering questions and, and being sort of in unison with, uh, you know, with the, the state people. In this one, it might be a little different. So we'll have to talk about yeah. how we want to do that. session. Yeah. I think we have some letters of support coming, but I, you know, I haven't seen them yet. Uh, it's not a moment too soon at right. this point. Yeah, because so. the work session is on the 12th and this doesn't have to be sent to him until the 14th. Uh, from what it, the conversations I had last week or so, I think there's going to be some letters of support. Um, and I think um, like one of the sessions in, uh, in Ocean City the other Tuesday was the afternoon with the cabinet secretaries and I talked to uh, the State Department of Planning people about this issue and and some conversation followed up after that. So hopefully everything. Do, do you, when was that? Do you think that affected what, um, what we're seeing here in the? I think so because uh, uh, that was on June the 25th when they had this session with the cabinet secretaries <laughs> and uh, I had conversation with some county folks the past week or so about uh, letters. Okay, well, June, th this was really heating up in June. We right. were having a lot of discussions yes. with various people at the state, the county. So, yeah, that would have been, that, that may have really helped. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I know you were intending to do that, yes. but I don't think I ever got the word. Yeah, that, yeah you, I didn't get a chance to tell you, but that cabinet session with the round uh, secretaries is really helpful down there because it, this year we had 28 cabinet secretaries in the room, and you could go from whoever you wanted to from one to one one-on-one -on -one conversation and uh, talked to uh, Wendy Peters that day and uh, another gentleman from the Department, State Department of Planning. And uh, when I got phone calls from the county, they said that they had talked to Wendy and <coughs> so it, was, it, it was helpful. So. Okay. okay, that's all I have. Okay, okay. Dep Deputy Clusey. He will not bore you. <laughs> I say he will not bore you. And he'll read the right month report as opposed to what I did last month. Thank you. Thank you. The dates of June 17, 2018 until July 21st, the Care County Sheriff's Office responded to 69 calls for service at the town limits of Union Bridge. Out of those calls for service, only three required a report, which were the following. On June 19th, at approximately 3.46 p.m., deputies responded to the 100 block of East Elgar Street in reference to a domestic assault. The investigation revealed that parent and child got into a mutual physical altercation over, the over what the juvenile was wearing. Uh, neither party wanted to pursue charges. The case was closed by lack of prosecution. On July 9th, at approximately 4 p.m., deputies responded to the 100 block of North Main Street in reference to a late reported domestic assault. Invest investigation revealed that the assault occurred out of town limits on July 7th between husband and wife. The case remains open pending further investigation. On July 17th, at approximately 12.45 a.m., deputies responded to the 100 block of East Broadway Street in reference to an assault. Investigation revealed that several known parties were assaulted over an argument. Case remains open pending further investigation. Um, in front of you, you have the uh, quarterly report. Um, so far this year, we're at 336 calls for service. Um, within the town limits, out of those 336 calls for service, 36 of them required reports. Um, so where does that leave us for 40 areas? Um, we are up 30 from last quarter from this year. Uh, we're up from 11 from 2018 this quarter. And 
in 2017 were up by 23. Um, by events or reportable offenses, we are up by 10 from last quarter this year, 13 from um, 2018, and one from 17. There's graphs at the end. Unfortunately, um, while I was listening to you guys, the reportable events graph is all screwed up. Yeah, so Don, I'll get you a new one. Um, other than that, we do have one upcoming event coming up, and this is New Windsor National Night Out. It's August 6th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the New Windsor Carnival Grounds. Um, at this time, I have over 40 vendors with several demonstrations, lots of kid activities this year, and food. Um, and the uh, food is only lost by class. And uh, hope to see everybody there. Other than that, that's all I got. I think it's important, you know, you, you say like 336 calls, people understand that you have, how many have actually took reports, you know? 36. Yeah, you know, yeah. 300 and some calls, only 36 were reports done. Just goes to show you that people call the police and they call for ambulances when they get hardly anything, you know? Ambulances used to go out when they had people really needed ambulance. Now people call the ambulance when they have an upset stomach, they have a headache. Uh, so that gives you a lot more calls than you used to have. Uh, in my day, for my parents to call the police because I didn't wear what they wanted me to wear, I'd have wore something else. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's just the nature of people today that they don't, they don't run their households the way they should and they want the police and they want everybody else to do it for them. So I think it's important that people, when they look at these charts and they say 336 calls in a quarter, but only 36 of them took reports. So I just want to make that, you know. So and, well, the 336 is for a year to date. Yeah. Out of those, 83 of them were traffic stops. Yeah. So, so. Um, 43 of them were building checks, you know, so. Again, every time we enter something into our cash right. system, it's generating something. So, absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And, and while we have you there, I have I have a request, uh, and I've, you've probably seen it, the trash that's on the bank parking lot that I think the gentleman is putting there. I was going to clean it up, but if I clean it up, it may not be real. You know, I may get a little bit aggravated with the person, so. Yeah, so um, I actually was on the phone with the state's attorney's office trying to figure out what we're going to do with this gentleman. So, yes. Okay. So, thanks for the process. Yeah, are you going to stick around after the meeting? I'm going to talk to you anyway. Bye. Bye. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, we're down to public comments and concerns. I know we had rec council here tonight. Is she still here? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm, going to, I'm just going to skip by a little bit and let Laura introduce one of our other guests back here because we have, a, I don't know whether he's going to get up and say anything or not, but. Probably not. <laughs> so my son Sawyer is in the back row. He is a Boy Scout and he is here because he is going to be working on his citizenship in the community merit badge. So he needs to attend a local town meeting. So lucky for him, he gets to come and spend the night Spend the evening with his mom. <laughs> but that's my youngest, my youngest of six. He's 12. So are you having fun, Sawyer? Well, and while, you know, while we're talking about Laura's family, her son also, uh, through the Carroll County chapter of the Maryland Municipal League, we give out scholarships every year at her I guess the middle, son number three. Son number three <laughs> did win a scholarship through the Maryland Municipal League, the Carroll County chapter this year. So, uh, and the judging committee didn't even realize it was her son. Well, that's that's the way they're supposed to do when, it. When when we went to the meeting and I told him that he's like, "You're kidding." Yes. So it's definitely a fair Wasn't contest. Nice. So, those scholarships are out there. We need more people to go out there and try to get them every year because. I know there's some, uh, some children go out there and get as many as 15, 20 scholarships during the year. I know uh, Heather Shockley. Heather Shockley, <laughs> which everybody knows is uh, 
Vicki Shockley, Vicki Greenwood, you spend on town council, her daughter, I don't know how many she didn't get this year, a lot of them. And uh, they all count up when you start, and Amy will find out, and she's got two that's going, and Laura's had, got six that's going to be doing this, so it, it helps. And I'm sure Sean's gonna have the same problem here after a while with his <laughs> family, so there's plenty of scholarships out there. Okay, uh, anyone else? Public comments or concerns before we go on down through the meeting? Neither or not, I did the Carroll County Times. Okay, we'll have to get you to state your name and address. Oh, Charles please. Pickett. I'm at 142 West Broadway Street. The end of the law. The end of the line. Um, I get the Carroll County Times, and I've read a very interesting article in the Carroll County Times this past week about New Windsor and their wonderful building projects. Uh, I just want to make the comment that I certainly hope in my lifetime I can see the same for Union Bridge. I would be nice. Now, you're talking about the state government. We have Larry Hogan in there now. He ought to be very sensitive to the people up here in this area, because generally speaking, it's a good Republican area. Um, I remember what Willie Don Schaefer did when he wanted Route 97 in from Baltimore to, to Annapolis. Record time for putting a piece of road work in. They skipped everything, impact studies and everything else they put the road in. So. I would like to see that uh, since I've moved to Union Bridge, which has only been two years, they closed the bank, they closed the hardware store. I can't be responsible for either of those. They closed the liquor store. I could be responsible for that because I don't buy that much. <laughs> but I'd love to see Union Bridge grow. And that was one of the things that you ran on, and I sure hope that well, I see it in my lifetime. I'm hoping I see it in my lifetime too. <laughs> I was just reelected. I want to see it. I want to see it happen in the next. Get started in the next four years anyway. But like these ladies were saying here earlier, we're very careful because growth has to pay for growth. One and of the things I can tell you from being in business for many, many years, the more layers of management you have, the more it costs you. And sometimes the slower it gets. Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> but thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, we'll start with our committee meetings, committee reports then. Ellen? Um, Sunday morning I was there bright and early and uh, worked at the registration desk checking people in, helping those first timers that uh, hadn't been there before, giving them little tips and things like that. Uh, Sunday was also the um, wrong list. The chapter officers meeting that they have for us every year, where they give us information to bring back to our municipal chapter. I attended that, and as a representative of the engagement and outreach committee, I attended the municipal first-time attendees meeting, which they have on Sunday before the conference starts. To um, let them know that there's people there to help them out, the new, the, the new attendees, if they things, and, and what they can get from MML. Um, I did not bring my paper with me, I'm sorry, so I don't have what I did Monday. Tuesday was the business meeting, which I always attend, and once again, Union Bridge got their Banner City, Banner Town year tag, which Don was on vacation, so I didn't let it lay around. I just put it on there for you, so you it didn't get lost, because it's such a big little thing there. Um, I also attended the SNAP Municipal Grant Making Workshop, which really wasn't what I thought it was gonna be, because I thought it was more about us getting grants, but it's more about um, putting together grants for your for things to happen in the town, whether it be for the residents or the businesses, or whatever, or example would be the um, facade to make a better facade for your building. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, wow, this was such a waste. And then the gentleman beside me started talking and gave me some information, which I've yet to pass on, about where to get grants that don't cost you anything to make the grants 
that you want to make for your town. So say we wanted to make a grant to improve the look of the main street houses or businesses, whatever, we could actually get grants from this place to have the money to give the grants to the people that wanted to apply for it. Um, I also attended the, um, on Tuesday, the receive surplus property from the state, which was very interesting, and I've got a lot of information from that. And I helped to lead the new officials meet and greet where the engagement and outreach committee, outreach committee members, of which I was last year, um, have a room reserved where any new time, first time attendee or even older attendees who wanna come in and communicate with them can come in and we can discuss whatever's, whatever they wanna talk about, whether it's how they do what they do at the meetings or at their meetings or where they get information on things, any questions, concerns they have. Um, and then on Wednesday, I was also there for the um, WINGS meeting, which is Women in Government Service, which is actually going through a restructuring and um, figuring out what exactly they want to do. So that was pretty much it, except for whatever I did Monday, which I don't have written down. Okay. All right. I saw your other report. On my other report, um, no problems with trash or I think everything else is taken care of. Laura? Okay, so I attended on Sunday the successful municipal county collaboration. Um, there we just talked about um, working together with county and state and not really, um, I guess, um, said stay in your lane, don't uh, take other people's businesses. Uh, the one thing that I liked that uh, Salisbury talked about is they created a program called SWIFT, which is the Salisbury Wacomico, um Integrated First Care Team, and it was designed to reduce the non-emergency overuse of 911. And they received a grant in the amount of $75,000 from Care First, and then they received in-kind donations from the uh, Peninsula Re Regional Medical Center for $60,000 a year. And what they would do is they had a paramedic and a registered nurse go to different homes um, of people who had called 911 five or more times in a six month period for non emergency calls. So they would go and they would check blood pressure, they would go and help dispense medicines. Um, sometimes they, they would get calls for people who need to get in or out of their wheelchairs or get into their beds. So these, that's what they do. And they said they now have like 80 regular patients that they visit. Um, all the time, and that was just an interesting way to go about um, relieving 911 of excessive phone calls. Um, on Monday, I took the opioid overdose response training. Um, we talked a little bit about the need for um, response training and how to administer Narcan, and we were each given a Narcan kit. Um, we are also, uh, one, one quote that I liked is, if we walk away, we only contribute to the problem. I attended the opening general session with Dr. Bertice Berry, who was hilarious, and she had a lot of um, one lines that, um, um, she was good. Like one of them said, if you ain't dead, then you ain't done. Um, we don't make mistakes when we are new at something, we make mistakes when we are comfortable with something. Um, she said, you can be dumb all by yourself, no need to join with stupid. So um, she, she was hilarious. Um, soak in the praise because we need, we need to reserve it for the bad days. Um, stop taking on the problems that everyone else. Fix your backflow valve. Um, one thing she said I liked, she said, ask for a story and get that story. We are connected to each other through narratives. Um, I attended the Active Shooter Situational Awareness. Um, I had taken that class a few years ago and I kind of liked the one from a few years ago better than the one from this year. Um, last time they gave ideas of how to react if, um, if you're in an active shooter case. Um, and this one was just more, um, they didn't really give you ideas. But they did say if you are in, um, in, around an active shooter that you should run as far away as possible and do not stay in sight, keep running and do not stop. Um, I know sometimes the kids at schools have been advised to go run and hide someplace, but they're saying just keep running. 
Um, it says, if you cannot run, hide in a secure room, not under a desk. Conceal yourself in a dark room, cover windows, turn off lights, and lock and block the door. Silence your phone and turn off your vibrations because they said your vibrations can still be heard. Um, and call 911. Um, the third option is to fight. I attended the Community Emergency Response Team, which is CERT. Um, that is just a group of well-organized and well-trained volunteers who help, um, able to assist in emergencies until professionals arrive. And it said it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, but when it's going to happen, so be prepared. I attended the general session uh, with Charles Marone, I guess is how he says his last name, is why are so many cities and towns across North America going broke? Um, he has a website called strongtowns.org. Um, he said, be with people, obs observe them, and be co-creators of space. I also attended the Receive Surplus property from the state and have a bunch of resources for Dawn. They, they said that um, FEMA overbuys, and instead of storing their items in warehouses, they want to donate it. They donate things, um, things that are donated, are meal kits, computers, furniture, copy paper, medical supplies, office supplies, water, food, MREs. Uh, Band-Aids, uh, tablets, generators. I attended the Tiny Towns Forum. Uh, and I guess the last one I attended was the preparedness for town events. Um, and they said if someone's going to plan some any kind of event in town to make sure you find out if it's a personal event or a public event, if it's going to be something. They said some people had um, reserved like a pavilion to, you know, one day and they realized that it was going to be a community event and they did not have the proper resources. And um, so they had to step in and um, handle that themselves. They had mentioned that, um, was that the class? Maybe it wasn't the class. One of the classes, um, I guess it wasn't that one. Oh, yes, it is. Um, they were having an Earth, Wind, and Fire tribute band, but somebody had falsely advertised it, that it was Earth, Wind, and Fire coming. And so they said on social media it had posted and shared so many times that 30,000 people said they were coming to this event. And they said the most they ever had at these events was 200 people. <laughs> so they had to put the word out quickly through social media that it was not Earth, Wind, and Fire, but a tribute band. Um, and then they said they still had like 5,000 show up to hear this tribute band, but they said, of course, it was 105 degrees that day, and they had to have extra watering sta water station and extra cooling fans, and the traffic was a disaster. Um, so they said, you know, if you have an event and it gets shared on social media, track that so you can um, prevent things like that. They also said that um, one, of the one of the cities had, was selected to do an ice cream tour, and it was advertised on a radio that had 600,000 listeners, and people started um, RSVPing that they were going to attend this ice cream tour. And the town, the city finally called the radio station and said, you know, how many ice creams are you planning to have? And they said, you know, I forget what it was, like 300. <laughs> they said we had like 12,000 people wanting to come to this. It's the last day of school. You better have more ice cream than, you know, than that. So uh, I thought those were interesting stories that should just, you know, monitor social media and make sure that if people are planning events, you know how many people are going to be there so you know what resources you need. So. Okay. Edgar. Okay. <clears throat> On Monday, um, I went took the one class, uh, Village Movement and Aging Place, which that's a, it's like a committee or a group of people that you have in your town that goes around and helps the senior citizens uh, do tours, maybe take them to the doctors and stuff like that. Uh, then I attended the active shooter uh, citation awareness and then I tasted uh, the community emergency response team, which might be involved anyway, being up along to the fire company on this one. Um, <clears throat> then Tuesday morning, I went through, done all the uh, exhibits and talked to some of the people that has playground equipment that uh, we'll be looking into probably. Um, and then Tuesday afternoon, I went to the, uh, the DS Supply uh, property, which 
I've seen just about all of us attended that class. <clears throat> and then I went to the tiny towns, which it's uh, the real small towns, and they talked about how they uh, operate and trying to get grants and stuff to do their things. And then Wednesday, I took the uh, planning and protocol, <clears throat> preparing us for, for the town events. And Laura was there with me, so that's about all I have. Okay. Thank you, Edgar. Oh. Well, I guess I'll get to pretty much what Laura already said. <laughs> I think you were most of my I did, uh, I, I was disappointed a bit in the actor shooter uh, uh, class. <clears throat> I did go to one different on recycling, the future of recycling. And around 2000, it was really an upswing around 2000. By 2010, <clears throat> it leveled off. And actually now, some of the recycle centers have closed. So I'm a big recycle person in our, in our household. So we actually, we need to, uh, to the behavior, we need some changes and some education on, on recycling. <clears throat> Uh, and the next two or three years, it's going to be recycling is going to be a little tough. Uh, just like our trash bag or our plastic bags, you're at a grocery store now, you can't put them in recycling. Uh, the, re the incinerators seems like that's not a, uh, a no no in some areas where you can't burn anything. So, anyway, it's something we've got to keep our eye on this recycling. I'm also interested in the, uh, I will mention the surplus equipment. That seems like a pretty good thing. Maybe we, we need some equipment here in town since we have a limited budget. So, <clears throat> tiny towns, I heard some of the, uh, the discrepancies and issues that tiny towns have. But one of the more inter interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, since I'm on streets, uh, one of the vendors is uh, concrete and I'm very interested in cement. And they have got a program out there starting, actually it's in, based in Frederick, one of them. It's called overlay or white topping. And it's, if you put concrete down, it may be a little bit more expensive, but it's, it can last 20 to 30 years, far over what some of your, your black top. And since we have an ongoing issue out here with North Main Street, and since O'Malley raped all these towns and took our highways or funds away, and Hogan, Governor Hogan has helped us in bringing some of our, uh, our funds back, it's still an ongoing problem. So it's really an area out there I'm really gonna be looking into, uh, possibly uh, of saving some money in the long run. That pretty well takes care of my meetings. <clears throat> Also, back to our regular job. We have a post up here at the parking meters that Amy called as we have a post that is protects the meter. An individual backed into it, broke the thing completely off. I just fixed the thing and then broke it off. So we gotta fix that again. And we're starting to pave streets here today. We did some milling over on uh, Lightning Street and also on uh, East Broadway. And I want to thank Lehigh for donating stone out here behind the, uh, the town hall here on West Broadway Extended. Uh, we put some stone down and next year we will be paving that. With Thomas. With, uh, we'll hope, we'll concrete, I hope, so we'll yeah. see. <laughs> and so that's, uh, and and I'm really, I'm really excited about Jerry Stanball here, down here in the old uh, grocery store with the new brewery is going to be. He's got a lot of exciting ideas inside. It really looks nice. He's not near finished, but it's just like Perry and I, we, we tend to tear a little, the uh, sweet corn uh, festival there. That's unfortunate it was so hot. But uh, I'm really excited for you bridge here on some of these uh, things that are happening. So that's it. Okay. Amy. I had two calls for water and sewer, a leak on Benedum Street, which was on the customer side, and a bill question, which I forwarded to our town clerk, Don. Um, 
Our Substance Abuse Expo is on Thursday, October 24th from 4 to 8 at the Fire Hall. I attended our planning and zoning meeting on July 18th. We have a new town, um, the town has a new county planner, Ms. Nair. Um, she updated the commission on the county's bicycle pedestrian master plan, the triennial update to the Carroll County Water and Sewer Master Plan, and the master plan amendment and the comprehensive rezoning. The 2018 annual report has been accepted by the county's planning commission and has been submitted to the state. I also attended, attended the Maryland Municipal League Summer Conference, um, which was titled Together We Can. Um, I benefit so much from all the expertise offered at this conference. It's absolutely amazing. I also attended two general sessions, um, an opioid overdose response training, active shooter situational awareness meeting, community emergency response teams, um, the how towns, nonprofits and in need populations can receive surplus property from the state tiny town discussions and an ICMA RC security guarantee for investment, which taught you how fraud can happen and how to avoid it. It was a really amazing class. Um, also on Tuesday, June 25th, there was a vote for the MML's 2019-20 Board of Directors and our mayor, Perry Jones, was voted president-elect for the ensuing year. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, we are also recognized as a banner town, as Ellen said, and our town reaches this status by a lot of hard work and participation from these council members here. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, my, my favorite thing at the whole entire conference is on Tuesday afternoon, my kids are allowed to enter the exhibit halls. This allows them to see how local government works. Um, it sparks conversations about goals and methods to help bring things into our local town here. And um, my kids, at the age they are at, they are watching these goals. They're, they're, they know they're ambitious, but they're achievable. So um, that's exciting for me to see them because I want them sitting here when they can be. Um, I would just like to thank the town and the people in it for the opportunity to attend and learn. Thank you. Okay. One thing, uh, do you know the date of the uh, parade for Francis Scott Key? It's September, September 18th. 18th, okay. So September 18th, there will be a parade in Union Bridge. It will come down Main Street, uh, start about the same way the Fireman's Parade. It's uh, every year the people at Francis Scott Key, they do this parade. It goes from town to town. This year is Union Bridge's turn, so that will, but it starts early. That's a 5.30 in the evening parade, so it, it takes a place, and then they leave here to go out to school, and they do a, I think they still do a powder puff football they team do. game after that, so uh, uh, hopefully there will be plenty of people out here, and then also to go to Key after that to watch this football game, so that's the beginning of the year, so. Uh, well, I think they've already applied for their permits and things like that, so, and I gave them permission to do that, so they will be doing that. The and then also, um, just talk to Gene Kirkman. I gave him approval. Francis Gut Key is doing a fundraiser, and they're going to do a car wash, and we're going to let them do the car wash at the fire hall, so we'll just have to keep a track on the water, but they are going to do a, a fundraiser. Uh, with the high school students, and it goes to, uh, uh, they have two different dates, and I don't know what they are right now. Gene, uh, I'd have to get it for you. Uh, Gene gave, talked to me uh, a couple of days ago about it. When he talked to the school, they wanted to know if they could do it. I'd have to get the dates. I got so many dates, and I didn't put the date of the car wash down, so I'll get that to you. Uh, our next work session, it, like we were saying earlier, is August the 12th at 6.30, and our next council meeting is August the 26th. Is there anything else before we adjourn? If not, I hear a motion for adjournment. I make a motion that we adjourn this meeting. I second it. A motion and a second. Any questions? All those in favor, ayes? Aye. Aye. Those motions carried. Thank you very much for attending.